because I think there are people who can be in orgies who are like contained still that drinking doesn't necessarily liberate it can also confine yeah, yeah so it's yeah. not no just that the, makes sense it's not just the act i think there are people who engage in sex and feel so enslaved by it in certain ways then um you know like if you're really connecting to someone and really experiencing that surrender and not just like chasing a high or a rush yeah yeah and i like to think about dionysus a lot in that um in therapy too is like a cycle where you have to dionysus was also about like wine but he was also about the agriculture of it like you've got mm. to plant the seeds you got to tend to it and then you can get drunk so it's like the complete cycle yeah, of yeah. ecstasy where it's not just all about the drinking. Like he's also like, okay, we got to start getting ready for the next harvest. Come on. And so I like the idea of like completing the cycle. Cause I think we focus so much on just like that release and that, and I think we create false surrenders, mm, yeah. you know, like where, well, it's kind of what the food thing I was talking about. Like we create like diets and then we're like, you know what? I'm just going to eat all these donuts. And we feel like we've surrendered to something or like, I'm just going to drink all day because it feels like we've s surrendering. But I think what we really need to surrender is something deeper, you know? And, mm. and, and so for everyone, that's a little different. But I think that we create these structures to rebel from because we don't know how to release these kind of uncertainties or insecurities or other barriers. Mm -hmm. So it's not that I want to go on some sort of mad drug-fueled orgy because i don't think that would make me feel good but how can it be kind of the spiritual sense of like acceptance uh, accepting another person ac accepting a kind of a state um yeah so yeah welcome to what's my thesis i'm your host javier proenza and today my guest is anthony bodlovich we met through so young shin yep. and you collaborate on stuff you have actually i mean this is not the first time that i've had pictures of you in the background Oh. Yeah, like your butt was in the background of hers. Don't you remember? Because it's... <laughs> did you watch hers at all? I Oh, yes. No, I no, no, you're more than... I studied it very carefully. <laughs> I don't remember my butt. Your butt is right here okay. next to me because there's the there's her lying oh, in down. Oh, in my profile. Yeah, in your okay, profile. Okay, I thought So Young might have taken some um, food law pics yeah, and, no, and no. not showed me. <laughs> no, it was uh, much tamer than that. And yeah, yeah and she did say she had to rotoscope those butts, though, those cheeks. Oh, well, okay. Well, that's true. <laughs> so how you been, man? That, that's when I met you. I've seen a little bit of your practice. We'll talk a little bit about that because you, you, even w like with her, you guys have a specific one that I didn't understand when I interviewed her and I hadn't seen before, Yeah, uh, which is like the dating sort of element of it. But let's introduce you okay. first Sounds before good. we get into all that. Uh, where are you from? What's your deal, bro? <laughs> what's, what's my deal? So I was born in San Pedro, okay. which is in LA County, but my parents are from Croatia. All right. So I was first generation American, um, and my sister was two or three when she came. So it was kind of interesting growing up in that space. I learned Croatian before I learned English and sort of, uh, my mom learned a lot of her English from soap operas. So we watched a lot of Days of Our Lives, General Hospital, so she could say coma <laughs> and paternity tests, but couldn't order a pizza. Um, yeah. So it was kind of an interesting kind of growing up in this little kind of enclave in LA, but not really accessing LA until I really got to college and went to UCLA art school. And that's when I was like learning about things like film and Wait, music. so you went to UCLA, uh, what, what decade? Let's... The decade, I mean, I can tell you, I was there the <laughs> uh, 1998, 98 is when I as started undergrad. undergrad. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. How do you feel that that has, because a lot of my friends that are, are, have graduated from that program now are kind of on fire. How, how do you feel like, do you, was it like that in the 90s? I think so. I mean, I okay. think for me, I was just so kind of like, everything was so new to me that it was just an exciting time to kind of explore concepts I haven't explored before. But um, after graduating, I mean, th there was a lot of like Charles Ray was on the faculty at the time. And there was a lot of um, exciting stuff happening. I just feel like I was such a baby. Yeah, that yeah. I was just like, these are the first time I was actually thinking about a lot of things. So after graduating, I actually went and then eventually became an art therapist. Oh, really? Yeah. So sort of like I segued that kind of art as a way of knowing myself into working with other people in that realm as well. So it kind of went from art school to teaching, and then I became an art therapist. And then okay. went back to UCLA to get my PhD in culture and performance studies. And so I was working with, though, um, Barbara Drucker, who at the time um, was okay. This I have, yes, a, right. <laughs> I have a cat here. If you see the cat, not, not the first cat that f is featured on an episode. Um, I thought I had the cat. Um, 
locked away, but you know, oh, we love cats, cats here. Okay. Well, and cats, cats are a little bit less uh, aggressive than dogs when they need attention. So okay. she'll be fine. Okay. 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 Sorry. y'all. let's focus. Um, yeah, so I, I was able to sort of put together an interdisciplinary sort of um, panel of people. So I had like mm -hmm. a psychologist, a dance movement therapist, an anthropologist, an artist on my PhD committee because I really wanted to um, explore a program where my teaching, my therapy, and my art could be could benefit. Okay. And so performance studies became sort of a philosophical lens in which I thought I could understand all those aspects of my work. Yeah, so it's fun. That's interesting. So then, how long were you doing the art therapy? So I'm still doing it. Okay. Um, so I still have clients and I have a So practice. that's that's like your clients that you have been answering the phone calls yes. of, of all, exactly. as we've been setting up, it's always been, it's yeah. been a lot of like. Clients, ca clients and cats. It's just really uh, <laughs> encapsulates my life. Oh, I didn't mean to throw shade. I just, I'm just giving people no, no, an no, insight into that. I, I didn't think of a shade. I thought it was quite delightful. Um, so yeah, so I, I have a practice in Silver Lake where I see um, mostly um, right now married couples. Mm-hmm. And so I, it's just really fun to be able to use art with people, um, just to get them to think in creative kind of ways and just kind of be silly. And who I, has like, is there not to, I mean, I'm, I mean, there's confidentiality I got, you know, no, no, but I'm saying gender wise. And I know no. that that's even normative, like, mm -hmm. you know, problematic in the way. So I stopped myself, but like in cis couples, is there somebody like, do you find that there's like one partner that's a little bit more into the art? experience of it and like is a little bit more like comfortable or maybe that's not a gendered question maybe it's it do you find that like it, just in general it so depends like i think it depends on people's backgrounds and if they were traumatized with art making in elementary school oh okay and so no i find that it, it doesn't i don't really see like a gender component to it but a lot of it is just like you know if they are creative in general or if they're coming yeah. from finance or where where they're coming from in their experience with art but i kind of the way I kind of sneak it in is more just like kind of fun things we can do to explore some ideas. So it's mm -hmm. not like I get an easel out and put a beret on them and say, <laughs> let's, let's kind of make something beautiful. It's more just sort of like sometimes with couples, it's about having them draw together and you can see the dynamics at play mm. as opposed to if they're coming in and they're telling you, um, he said this, well, he said this, and then you're kind of like, I wasn't there. Yeah. I don't know what's going on. But watching them make art together, you can see a lot of those dynamics at play right there. And so I can say, oh, interesting. You kept um, swatting his hand away. <laughs> um, That's exactly what I was imagining. Yeah. So kind of getting them to work on things together or just be creative. Yeah. Like during the quarantine, a lot of people were going stir crazy. So I had them kind of invent holidays for themselves and Kind of think about like what they need in the moment. Maybe you should have been like, you know, everybody's <laughs> therapist during quarantine. Yeah, I felt like I was in a lot of ways because, you know, I was stuck in this, in my living room here and just like on a screen, yeah. just engaging um, with people. But it was, it was great to have that for myself as well, that connection to other people and a windows into everyone's world. Um, Literally through like windows yeah. machines. Yeah. And seeing and not seeing, um, and kind of, I'm not used to seeing the client's personal spaces. They usually come to my office. So it was interesting to see them in their elements. Oh, and, yeah. You know, and like in their flip-flops and whatnot. Maybe I mean, I had some people less lounging by pools. Oh, really? Um, yeah, just a lot of, you know, people were just free and loose, you know? <laughs> so who could blame them? <laughs> yeah. It's funny. I just traced the roots of the way that question that I asked you was informed. And it's literally because most of my relationship to couples therapy comes from stand-up comedy and it's usually <laughs> from the perspective of the guy that doesn't want to be in it so oh interesting so you're just assuming that these disgruntled men are coming to therapy uh, like, I gotta fucking draw yeah swatting away the color pencils well it reminds me of like my mom was trying to teach a guy one time I don't remember the context but it was like in a thing where the guy was obviously not an art educated person not like in a negative way, but he was like, I, 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 did I do this wrong? And she goes, no, you can't do it wrong. So yeah. that that's an interesting pressure that I think comes in. So you, I'm guessing you see a lot of stuff like that. Like, Well, <laughs> it's just interesting how kind of, I think, paralyzed people are when it comes to sort of expressing themselves. Yeah. There's such as like a, like a concern um, of either like, I'm going to see something in the art that they don't want to reveal or just like a lot of that perfectionism and that pressure. So I think getting 
to kind of have a more playful experience with art making, which is sort of why I love having it as part of my practice and kind of pulls yeah. into my own performance work is just about being an amateur. I think being amateur is like at art, yeah. Oh, sure. At anything, oh, I think yeah. it's so fun because the professionalism. Well, but hopefully not at therapy when you're a therapist. I mean, but I think there is something. Um, there is something about the playfulness that I think I do bring to the space where it's yeah, like yeah, yeah. I don't know. Let's figure it out together, as opposed to sitting there being like, I know exactly what your problem is, and let yeah. me tell you. But um, this idea of like we're still kind of figuring it out, and to have the glee of the joy of discovery, I think is really fun. So. I, I you know, have 15 years of experience and I'm very, you know, I think good at what I do. But I think part of it is I, I always think of it as like a, a space of play and possibility. As opposed to like a very like kind of didactic experience. No, that's, yeah, that's actually the word that I was thinking in my head. So you're not a didactic therapist. No, I'm, yeah, yeah. I, I think, um, yeah, I like to use humor and art and play and just sort of like, yeah. It's, it's, it's fun. And, you know, and the cat the, is the like, cats it's are, getting friendly. <laughs> the cats do sometimes make an appearance when I'm doing telehealth. Oh, really? Yeah. Really? Mm -hmm. Well, okay. So I think we're about topic time right now. Okay. And I, and you actually, whenever someone mess, sends me a topic, I want them to understand clearly that I completely forgot what, I, what it was. So okay. I'm in, I'm brand new and fresh. Okay. Um, so what are we dealing with today? Well, I was going to talk a little bit about thonic cults of ancient greece okay and, what does thonic mean so i know like, cults uh relating to like death or the underworld okay yeah so um it's kind of like a lot of my art performance work and even sometimes i think my therapy work kind of focuses on a lot of ritual and meaning making so yeah i thought it was it's kind of an interesting kind of reoccurring theme in a lot of my um praxis so i mm -hmm. thought it'd be maybe fun to talk about a bit Oh, I'm I'm definitely game. Uh, just a quick question before we go off into that realm. Are you dealing with like um, do you, like are you at all familiar with ritual magic in in this context oh, and yeah. chaos magic and all of that? Oh yeah, of course. Okay, all right, cool. Oh, so course. then let's go of to course. the origins. Uh, by the way, the cat's back. <laughs> you can't, you know, the cat's out of the bag. <laughs> I think the cats, I think they I think that cat knows how to do something yeah, to that door. They're, they're like velociraptors where they've learned cool. how to open. All Let's the just doors. be ready to spring into action if she knocks over something. Yeah. <laughs> That's I mean, the only concern. Yeah. But she's chill, she's chill. Or is it a he? Uh, Edel is a she. Is a she, all right. As far as I hate I misgendering cats even. Well, as far as I know. I mean, I just yeah. We'll see. <laughs> um but yeah, I used to work in an occult bookstore. Okay. And so I think a lot of my fascinating like i love horror movies i loved horror movies as a kid and i loved like the sort of macabre and i think there was something in it that i felt like i had a lot of knowledge and information that i wanted to sort of pull from mm -hmm. um so yeah so uh, ritual is a huge component of i think I, the way i consider therapy too like therapy is a liminal space in which potential is happening and art is kind of a metaphoric process which like magic is the same like if they're creating an effigy of their anxiety and they're burning it it's very mm. similar to sort of like a, a, a incantation or a, so a the '90s cliche from like pop culture of like burning everything oh, of, I, of an ex is like is actually there's something to it. I mean, let, let me. I was just at a solstice celebration yesterday, okay. and I still <laughs> smell like smoke. Okay, there's a lot. So to what burn. were they burning? Like, uh, well, we what were, kind of burned? We were burning like just effigies of things that we want to let go of. But like, what, what did, were people? open about what the effigies were oh, yeah, of course. okay so then like we had an effigy for what so there was like an well, intrusive I don't want, thoughts or no like kind of like um, i mean you don't have to give like i know i feel like i'm spilling everyone's um so uh, for i think it's like letting go of relationship patterns that are negative letting go of okay. sort of like conceptions of being not not good enough things like that you know does anyone ever get enticed or, or, or eager to like Take those things and instead of burning the effigy, use it as a voodoo doll and just torture its torturer. Um, no, but I'm getting a lot of insight <laughs> into you today. I think there's something. Oh, no. Yeah, I'm, there's... Fucking, I'm never interviewing another yeah, therapist. I, yeah, I'm like, well, maybe, do you want to lay down? <laughs> oh, you do, it, you do it like that? You do I it mean, like listen, I'll, people do lay down sometimes. Be yeah, out of but it. I'm not an analyst, so I don't like, you know. But, you don't, but they yeah. sometimes see the couch and they want to lay down and I'm not going to stop them. Okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? However they want to sit. You never think that that's like an evasive mem move of like not making eye contact? Or do you think it opens people up a little bit more? You know, whatever people need to look at to look within. Okay. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so that's like an acknowledgement that maybe your face isn't the most healing all the time. Well, maybe they just need to be looking into their own self. 
Uh-huh. Do you know what I mean? And not like interacting with your reactions, like with you. you yeah, know, because I, I'm constantly making faces in therapy, like, <laughs> oh no. Yeah. And then I start you know, jotting down <laughs> copious notes. Well, all right. So then, uh, what is it? Thonic? Thonic. Uh, yeah. So um, I really resonated with like the myth of Persephone and Demeter. I don't know if you're familiar with Greek mythologies. No, not off the top of my head with those. I mean, I know I, remember, I studied it obviously, but yeah. it's been a while. So I, you know, I think it's one of the questions I also ask my clients is like, what are the things that they really were into as kids? or what they're currently into, because it sort of helps me understand how their brain is making sense of the world, like what mm-hmm. metaphors they're using. And I love this story. So real in a nutshell, you can maybe put a link down below to some like resource, <laughs> but um, it, it's like- No, there's no references in okay, this show. Perfect, because I don't probably know what I'm talking <laughs> it's about. It's not so don't my fact thesis, check me. it's what's my thesis. Yeah, okay, good, because <laughs> the question remains. <laughs> um, so it's like, uh, so Persephone, known as like Corey or Ma- the Maiden, Mm-hmm. was the the daughter of Demeter, who is the goddess of um, the grains, like agriculture. And um, Persephone was just like out and about, and she gets abducted by Hades, the god of the underworld, which is sort of... A, a, That's my dude. Yeah. Uh, basically agreed upon by Zeus, because he's down there all alone, and he's like, I have no one down here. This is kind of lonely. He drew the lat, like the shortest straw amongst the brothers. So Poseidon mm-hmm. got the sea, he got the underworld, Zeus got the sky. They all kind of like can roam around Earth. So Persephone's down there, Demeter's really depressed, and nothing is growing because she's not um, tending to the earth. And now the gods are getting a little nervous because humans don't have food. Uh, they don't have food to give sacrifices to the gods, and they're all in this chain that if um, the earth does not produce food, humans do not have the food, they do not make the sacrifice to the gods, everyone's dead. Mm-hmm. So they're like, ooh. And um, they negotiate this with Persephone's return. And but if you eat of the fruit of the underworld, you have to stay down there. And so Hades gave her some pomegranate seeds on her way out and she ate them. And then they're like, uh oh, back to the drawing board. And so they negotiated her stay half the year or four months, depending on the myth, in the underworld and the rest of the time on the on the ground. And that kind of explains the seasons. So when mm-hmm. she emerges in the spring, um, Demeter is happy, flowers, abundance, and then in the winter and the fall things are a little colder and more down. Mm-hmm. And so I just really resonated with that myth for some reason of this sort of um, this like kind of cyclical kind of place of going within and then this dark, these dark, kind of darker places and then like coming back out. And um, Carl Jung actually referred to therapists as like psychopomps. And a psychopomp is someone who can go between the land of the living and the land of the dead. So in Persephone is one of those psychopomps where she can go into the underworld and she can come back. And most people don't make that a two-way trip. You know, it's not it's not a round trip. It's usually one way, you know. So for Young, it was this idea that the therapist goes into the unconscious mm-hmm. of a client and has to pull stuff out to bring to the light. And they have to be able to, like, be prepared for that journey, mm. right? That you have to go into someone's dark spaces and not be too afraid because if you're sort of terrified, and then I also teach other people how to be therapists. And, you know, it's it's hard to have a trigger warning with a person. Yeah, because yeah. we might have our own personal experiences, but you don't know what a person's going to bring to you, and you have to be prepared because your own ghosts might come up up as well. Mm-hmm. You just don't do that work with the client. You got to go do that on your own time, either with your therapist, your shaman, whoever you want to do it with. So I really resonated with that even as a kid, and I think there was something about the similarity of the terrain of Croatia and Greece, because like pomegranates are there and the figs, and it just felt very like ah, oh, this is the place. And resonating with traveling to Croatia in the summer. And the United States, living here most of the time, this kind of idea of like being caught between worlds Mm -hmm. and being queer, same thing, like feeling caught between spaces. So I think there was something about that that I really resonated. And also where Persephone in the underworld is called um, Persephone, and it means like chaos bringer, and she's like a queen. So she has a lot of power in the underworld, um, where on the earth she's just kind of a maiden. So I really resonated with that, and I loved the idea. So a lot of the deities that these cults, um, were around were deities that actually were psychopomps that could go mm. to the land of the living and the dead because people wanted to know what was up. Yeah, yeah. You know, like if you went to the underworld, can you tell me what's going on and how we can have a better experience? So Persephone is one, uh, Orpheus is another, and Dionysus is a third. And so those are those are three entities that I. <laughs> is it the of... drink that gets Dionysus <laughs> in and out? No, well, uh, uh, <laughs> just know, blackout. No, drunk. Dionysus was uh, born of uh, a human woman. Okay. And then um, because of some trickery. 
Um, Hera, Zeus's jealous wife, tricked her in this way in which she was sort of destroyed, but the fetus survived. So Zeus sewed the fetus up into his calf. And so Dionysus was kind of born of a mortal woman, kind of had this death, and then was reborn in his leg. And so most of the time, if you had a, a, if a god had a child with a human, it was a hero mm-hmm. or like, like, you know, not a full god. It was a demigod. But yeah. Dionysus was a full god. But he was almost like... But because he was brought to term on a calf. Yeah, exactly. You know how that goes. And yeah. so, but a lot of it was that the people related to him because he had more of a connection and kinship to humanity. And also he brought he them wine. And he brought them wine. <laughs> but he was also sort of the god of, you know, and this is the, the, the one of the, the last cult I've yet to sort of incorporate because it's the hardest for me to understand because it's about surrender and ecstasy and getting through dance and through drink to this point of communion. Like, mm. um, well, that's hard. Cause I am very like, Ooh, le- letting loose is difficult. So oh, really? yeah, that's the finest, the, the finest, Oh, it is the finest, but it's the final sort of cult that I'm sort of still sitting with of how to reach that sort of sense of yeah. Connection, um, not through discipline uh, not through sort of routine or structure, but actually through abandon through surrender. Okay. So, so then that, then that's why I, okay, I get it because I was like, based on your practice and your associations, I would imagine that you're not a very reserved person, you know, just because like, I mean, I'm so young is not actually, she's very reserved and, but like the way that she, I get that she's like a little bit of a party girl and you guys seem wild. No, I mean like, like in terms of like the. Well, I got stories. Um, but <laughs> I'm sure she's got them of you. That's why. That's why it surprises me. Yeah. So, but I think that maybe now I'm starting to get a sense of like, like, I used to also be reserved, but I hung out with wild people so that mm-hmm. I would get pulled into that, mm-hmm. you know, because I would not, mm-hmm. of my own volition, gotten myself into half the trouble that I got into. Yeah, I'm. I think I love to sort of like, um through the guise of play and i think that's why performance is so liberating because there's like an understanding of like i'm doing this thing but it's within this kind of confine so like dionysus was also sort of the patron of of performance Mm -hmm. right of plays and so there's something about the safety of that space where i'm like okay we all know this is a performative space what we're doing here is meaningful and powerful but yet we know it's kind of contained in this kind of space and so when it comes to like being out in the world and like i grew up a lot with people who are just like alcoholics and mm. so i was just like always the one who's like helping people out of trash cans oh, and, like, I get it, I get driving it. people home so my the 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 revelry that i think i experience is more through play okay and through this complete surrender which i'm getting better at um i think it's, it's part of my practice too because i think of my um performances as interventions for myself and other people as well what do you mean by surrender? Because surrender can mean so many different mm-hmm. things, and it, it can actually have like religious connotations, spiritual mm-hmm. connotations. Mm-hmm. Is that what we're talking about? Well, I think of surrender as like the fulcrum of eroticism, of play, and of creativity, where there has to be sort of a letting go of, I guess you can call it like an ego, or like a conception of self to make room for a new self. And so kind of like letting go and letting a process take over, or letting an experience take over without trying to control or produce it. You know, and I think, um, yeah, so it's kind of like, I, I think I'm getting much better at that in these spaces, but to kind of have a full surrender to something where I, I still don't, I still kind of have to feel like I have to have like my hands on something. Mm. And so that's why a lot of my performances are um, improvisational. Like I don't really have a script because it forces me to sort of surrender in that moment with a, with the person, with the audience. Mm-hmm. And sort of that's kind of like, yeah, the, but you have like a basic outline that you riff around, right? Like for example, with the the one that I saw, it was like a dating competition. So there, the, you you have a bunch of threads, and then we we can go oh, in yeah. and to the art and back go to the in to and the, out. Well, yeah, because it kind of weaves through. So for example, let's like um, I'll I'll start with <clears throat> some of my work with So Young. Um, we are both kind of children of immigrants, but have obviously different experiences. And a lot of what we didn't get to surrender to was this sort of like Americana that was around us, you mm-hmm. know, where it's like people would have these parties and bounce houses and we'd have like an aunt we never saw come over and eat like a dry piece of cake, you know, it's like, 
I always thought like every American had a like a sunken living room in a basement with a I'm, foosball I'm table. I'm so lucky I'm Hispanic. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so it's like that's not a void in my heart. <laughs> yeah. And so and it was also just being kind of a little bit removed from your community, right? Yeah, so my yeah. parents like had a community of Croatians in in, in the town uh, in San Pedro, but we weren't like connected to these generations of family members when yeah. we were here. Um, so a lot of our work involves around that and it's a lot about kind of play and creating kind of thinking about it in, as form of ritual. So like this, um, beautiful, I'd like to wear unitards or leotards when I'm performing because it's a very easy way to signify something performative is happening. Mm -hmm. But, um, this, and you were at that. This is, yeah, I wore this one on one of, on our kind of dating show. So, um, we ended up having like a six hour kind of dating show that was, um, live in front of a studio audience. And um, it was really taking these kind of ideas of how these these performative kind of ways we connect to people, like looking at dating advice, like look someone in the eye and let them know you're interested or like touch them, like I'm going to go to the bathroom. Um, and we like read all of these ways in which like we're trying to find connection because I think that's what ultimately a lot of like these cults and spaces are about people looking for connection and community and being and and also like the the barriers that get in the, those way in that way, and so Sewing and I were single at the time, thinking about like okay, well, how do we connect to people? And so we created these costumes and these rituals of connection. So we had like a jacket that had little dots on it. It was like a twister jacket. So mm -hmm. one of us would be talking to a potential dating partner, and someone would yell out "right hand red," and we'd have to like touch each other until we were kind of in this pretzel shape. Um, and and just like a hat that like locked you in together, so you had no, um, you could not do anything but look each other in the eye. Mm -hmm. So it's like playing on the sort of performance of connection and 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 meaning making, and but being very playful with it. So we had the theme of cake. Mm -hmm. Um, was you know dating shows sometimes have like themes. So ours was like cake and a lot of cake puns and stuff like that. But. <laughs> It was Wait, just, what? What's an example of an actual theme on a show? Because I don't, I can't visualize. Yeah, like, like you know, like the rose, like okay, uh, the bachelor right, gives right. the rose. Oh, cake pops. So like, yeah, they weren't cake pops. Oh, okay. there was actually slices of cake. We're like, who's gonna make the cut? Who takes the cake? Okay. You know what I mean? We just had, you know, just helpful to have. I mean, I, we strangely enough for our research, I didn't do a lot of watching of dating shows, but did a lot of <laughs> research of writing. I think it's reading. like zeitgeisty enough. Yeah, you... it's in. It's here. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and it's like how they say that generational trauma is like. <laughs> yeah, it's embedded. Yeah, exactly. The Bachelor is now part of my DNA, even, even I've if never you've never watched episode. it. Yeah. Um, and also, like, I dated a fictional person for a year. Okay. As part of a performance as well to like, understand my dynamics, and so I had a troupe of actors um, who played the same character. Um, his name was Jason, and he, um, you know, where they wore the same outfit, so I could make sure I knew it was Jason, but it was just like. A, an experiment for me to see like okay what are these dynamics and after we'd like talk about the date and like they'd have to take notes because a, a bunch of people were playing him so to have continuity they would have to log we had all the dates logged so the other jasons could catch up and then if that you know jason number two took over he knew what jason number one and i did on a date okay it was very um telling about I would what want to be the first jason <laughs> well listen jason one jason one two and three and four all switched so sometimes i had a date with jason one 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 and oh, okay. then three came in and then two came in so it was like because it's really hard to ask someone to date someone for a year <laughs> that you know it's a big commitment things i haven't thought about it's a big in commitment. My practice so i needed like a lot of different people to be on board um, but it was but it was interesting to see how little people really listen to you, like because the dates I look at the logs and I'm like I don't have a younger sister. What are they like? Who? Where do they get this information? <laughs> um, but also realizing that like that Jason turned into every other person I've dated before. I'm like I make Jasons. <laughs> like the, my positionality and the way that I'm interacting with people sometimes brings out these qualities. So. So then, like, what are examples of those qualities? I mean, without I, without going into like, I mean, dark. emotionally unavailable. Like Jason's not emotionally oh, yeah. available. Aloof. So um, then, how do you make that happen? Well, because I think I um I'm overly anticipatory of people's needs, and I'm like overly, you know, like I'm not giving people space for my needs, and so I'm just like, I'm okay. You don't, I don't need anything over here. Let's take care of you, um, and then I don't get to test out their capacity. So it was to really helpful. You. <laughs> exactly. That's important. <laughs> yeah. And so I think, um, and yeah, it was weird. The feedback was sometimes a little, oof, oof. 
but um, like it was what, 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 what do you mean? What kind of feedback were they giving? They, just, were, they weren't critiquing you. So what? Like, oh yeah, it was sometimes critiques like, oh, like he was going on and on about something during dinner. I'm like, oh, I thought I was being engaging. Um, but, oh wait, so like about your dynamic, they yeah, were well, the, how they experienced me during okay. the dinner, and so, but it was great because I think a lot, all of us who participated in the project, kind of had some insights in our relationships because most of the time when you go on a date, you don't kind of sit down afterwards and say, okay, how'd that go? Yeah, yeah. What were some highlights? What will we do differently next time? <laughs> That's what I did. <laughs> uh, what's it called? So Young gave me a very thorough, and it came from you, so a very thorough breakdown and critique of my hinge. Oh, it yes. was very su successful. So maybe we can do a little segment here where you explain to people how to hook up a hinge. Yeah. Because I mean, it was very successful like, and I got it third hand. There you go. See, it's like 20% yeah. of my, I think, therapy practice is helping people with their dating profiles now. <laughs> but a lot of that is through, again, like creating these like play spaces. It's almost like laboratories, right? So yeah. Soyoung and I are examining these dynamics of relationships and it's really telling who we ended up with on that dating show. Um, we both... Like, and by the way... I would show you my, it, it, my like, because I because Molly was upset when I didn't, like, do it live on camera. I'm using that phone so that, to record, so I can't have you critique my my new one live, but I'm sure you can make it better. Okay, I'm sure We I can could. maybe do a segment of that yeah, some, I, somewhere down the road. I feel like there's a lot of tips I can give you just looking oh, yeah, at you. Yeah, just, fuck off. Yeah, just, <laughs> just a lot of different tips. Um, but we can do that later. And maybe do, like, a, a follow-up, you know, like a before uh, and after. I, I was unemployed for a while. <laughs> give me a break. Okay, you know, excuses are excuses. No, but. no, yeah, yeah. No, it's just, I, I mean, yeah, no, like, looking and looking sharp and dating is not something I always keep in the background. It's like a thing I turn on and off. I see. You know, so, so it makes sense that like, you know, like I'm disheveled and I'm not, but Hey, I don't have beard dandruff, so I'm making progress. Okay. I got, I didn't uh, know that was a thing you were experiencing. I'm so sorry. I'm glad it's, no, I, uh, I just needed beard oil. It's true. Yeah, that is true. So a slowly, tip. slowly we're making, yeah. I, I, if you guys need, uh, uh, Emmanuel Galvez gave me, I, he did it on the show, so it'll be out publicly but i was like yo how the fuck do you keep your shit so tight and he's like beard oil <laughs> that's great so i mean so that's just an example of like some of the work that sewing and i do together is like sort of examining our di our dynamic as friends as well as like our and kind of creating these like mini little experiments and i mm -hmm. think my own work is very similar um but again like i have certain kind of two different kind of um sort of projects I'm working on. One is uh, connected to Persephone and Demeter. And that's really around food mm -hmm. because a lot of the, the cult uh, of, of, of focused on like agriculture and these metaphors, like um, there's very little known about a lot of these cults because they were mystery cults. Mm -hmm. So we don't really know what happened. There's just like, you know, little tips uh, and little hints that we get in like pottery or things like that. But I was really fascinated. I was in a show... Um, that was all Virgo artists. It was called Most Likely to be Murdered mm -hmm. because uh, there was an article somewhere that Virgos um, are more likely to be murdered by loved ones. <laughs> I'm a Virgo. And, and then, you know, the Jason feedback was uh, adding to that. But the, and so it was kind of a, I was thinking about the Virgos and they're like ruled by their stomachs mm -hmm. and the constellation of Virgo um, kind of disappears in the fall. And, um, and, I th and sometimes it's connected to Persephone going to the underworld. So it kind of connected this idea of like food to this kind of place. And I was really fascinated with our relationship to food. And so a lot of my, uh, one of my kind of characters, I just call like the food guru, goes around and kind of purports this like spiritual philosophy around food. It's not what we, what doesn't matter what we put in our bodies, like our bodies are vessels for food to reach higher spiritual planes. So we need to like know what the banana wants. Mm -hmm. And bananas don't like to be eaten on the go. They like to be cut up. So they're like this like kind of false kind of, um, mythology around food and then I started getting more and more intense like cults tend to do you know at first it's like helpful hints and the next thing you know I'm doing gluten exorcisms where I'm just like pulling gluten out of people like psychic surgery to remove like gum that they have not digested for seven years mm -hmm. so a lot of it was just about like kind of looking at our relationship to our bodies and kind of the the tension that exists there and in our attempt to sort of like be healthy or stay young or stave off emotions and sort of like creating a, a different mythology in which we can look at these things. I did like spiritual pizza making at the armory. So it's a sort of like using food as this metaphor for connection, but also this kind of constant kind of, I think, battle of like, what are we going to eat? What are we doing to our bodies? But also it's a way of communing and connecting. 
So I have like this kind of food section and then the other uh, process is really related to memory. Mm -hmm. And I just love part of being a therapist is so delightful to hear other people's stories. And um, one thing I can share, because it was not under kind of a therapeutic guise, I was just volunteering at a senior center, kind of working with some of the people there. And I just was like struck by these like beautiful memories they'd have. And they'd like forget their like niece's name. But this one woman remembered she'd be in the, in the 70s, she'd drive on the freeway and she'd see this like tomato plant slowly grow in the crack of the freeway. Mm. She's like, it just never left me, this plant just like flourishing. She's like, I can't remember half the stuff in my life anymore, but I remember this tomato plant. And when we looked at why, it was sort of like she um, recalled being like, a, it was like a symbol of hope for her because she was going through a really difficult time. And if this tomato plant can thrive on the 405, you know, that she maybe felt like she had hope. So I really became fascinated with the things we remember and don't remember. Mm-hmm. And so like Orpheus, this other, um, other mystery From cult, the Matrix. Yeah. Well, No, I Morpheus, not Orpheus. Oh, yeah, exactly. Morpheus was sort of like a god of dreams, I believe. Okay. And um, Orpheus is the god of what? Uh, he was just a poet. He was just like a oh, really okay. cool poet, um, sometimes son of Apollo. He played music and rocks would cry. But he's an actual god or he's a person? No, he was a person who um, ended like up... Like an Aristotle type figure? Well, he was a, a mythic figure who's... Um, okay, so he's mythic. He's mythic. So okay. Eurydice was his wife. Um, she died on their wedding day. He was so upset about it. He decided to go to the underworld to go get her. And he played oh, music. I... So you know the, the story probably. The looking back one? Yes, the looking okay. back one. So, so he, finish the story for people that don't. So, uh, so Orpheus goes down. I to the spoiled underworld. it. Yeah, <laughs> Orpheus goes down to the. Well, you didn't. They don't know what you mean. Looking back. What does that mean? We're all looking reminiscing. back. Reminiscing. Reminiscing. So he um, goes to the underworld and he gets through by like being such a great musician. And Persephone, who's down there, she's like, "Let him go. Let him go find his wife." Because Hades, like, that's not what we do here. Like, you die, you die. But he was such a good musician and moved everyone that he was allowed to. But he said, "You're ready to see your wife. We'll walk behind you." Keep going forward. That's the exit. And if you don't look behind you, she will be there with you. But if you look behind and you have doubt, then she'll be taken away forever. And so he's making his way and he can hear her. He can hear her breath. He can hear her footsteps. And he's getting closer to the end exit. He says, I can't hear her anymore. And that moment of doubt causes him to look back. And then she's like pulled away. And then later his like, He's like, his head gets ripped off and it starts telling prophecies. But the idea is he was another, again, entity. I remember that story so differently. (laughs) What do you remember? Like, in my head, he's just like walking towards the end. He gets out and he's tired. And he's like, and he just forgets and he looks back. But she hasn't caught up to him. (laughs) I like how you just think he was winded. (laughs) I mean, I know this story from like years and years and years Like, he was just tired. (laughs) <laughs> um and so but the but they did and was, impatient yeah <laughs> in and, my version and, and i think that, that anxiety right yeah. so but he um ended up again being able to go um to the underworld so one of the things the orphics believed that you, when you get to the underworld you're supposed to drink from the river lethe which was the river of river forgetting mm-hmm. and so you forget everything and then you just like don't remember your life and so the Orphics would sometimes bury them, bury people with tablets called like totem passes that would be like instructions for the underworld. Like, don't drink from Lethe, go by the poplar tree, and there's a well there of memory. Drink from that one, and it was this way of kind of preserving your memory and yourself, mm-hmm. so you didn't lose yourself in the underworld, um, and could maybe be reincarnated with this kind of memory of self and continue to like live on in this way. Well, do you know uh, enough about the uh, Greek underworld for me to ask you about that? I think so, maybe. Okay. Cool. I mean, what, 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 what do you know about the Greek underworld? Because, I mean, when I think of ancient underworlds, it's really hard not to get away from, or it's really hard to get away from uh, Egypt, you know, and, and what they were believing. So, like, what was the uh, Greek oh, underworld yeah, the, in comparison? It's probably very different. Oh, yeah, very different, because the Egyptians were, like, really into, like, taking it with you. Mm-hmm. And the underworld of, of, of a lot of... Um, the, of a lot of ancient Greece. And again, there's so many, there's so many different um, sub beliefs, right? Mm-hmm. So there's kind of like the beliefs that we know because of writings that survived, but like different cities, towns might've had different experiences. But for the most part, when you die, you just like roam around in the underworld, like as a shade, like forgetting who you were and just kind of like, just like a weird mall or something where like, you, there's not a heaven. There's really not a hell. There were, there was a place for heroes. Mm-hmm. Um, similar to like Valhalla in Norse mythology, where like if you were a, a hero, you can go to this kind of nicer place of the underworld. But for the most part, it was just kind of like a 
you're just kind of gone. Um, sometimes but no one's aspiring for Olympus or anything like that. No, like Olympus was only the way where yeah. the gods lived. And then there was, um, why can't I remember the name? Like, uh, it was like the Elysium. big brother house also. Yeah. It's <laughs> kind of like, there was like a, the place for heroes and the place for everyone else. And there were some other sub subsets of belief in reincarnation that you can kind mm. of like maybe come back or there was different cycles of reincarnation in different cults. But for the most part, it was like, and Hades, you know, it, it depicted often as like hell um, but it wasn't, it wasn't. And Hades wasn't like an evil, maniacal, dark person. He was sort of like just the younger brother who got stuck down there and was kind of lonely. He was also called Pluto because it was, um, he was like very rich because like all the diamonds and jewels were underground. So he had like that wealth, but the underworld was just kind of like a depressing retirement home. Mm -hmm. He just kind of roamed around. And so there, there wasn't the sense of like uh, a heaven in the same way. So then is does is it fair to say that then that leads to a more live for the moment kind of culture or cuz they're not like puritans I mean obviously Greeks aren't puritans. Well yeah I mean I think it also was like kind of who who had the ability to sort of create a name for yourself right so there's so much in like same thing with Norse mythology like the heroes mm -hmm. if you were a hero or you died nobly like there was an opportunity for you to be rewarded but a lot of people, and this is why I think a lot of the Thonic cults came around, because they were trying to have a better sense of the underworld. They, were, they weren't happy with this sort of like, you die and then you're just like a shade. Um, they wanted to continue. So Orphix wanted to remember who they were. And Persef the cult of Persephone and Demeter like, believed in kind of reincarnation, as, and as did some of the Dionystic uh, cults as well. So I think a lot of the cults were about like trying to make more meaning in those spaces, where it just wasn't kind of great unless you were elite you just kind of were like mm. yeah you're relegated to getting fucked yeah but one of the things i think i appreciate about polytheistic religions that i really like is that nothing was like so moralistic like if you were like if you fell off a cliff it wasn't like you got you angered god it was like you could have gotten the way zeus and Hera could have been having a fight yeah, yeah you know like the gods had their own impulses and own desires and it was much more reckoning with natural forces i think than kind of ascribing specific um morality or intention to it so i think in some way death was very matter of fact in, in that way as well which is interesting because then when you are let's say you're in the cult of one particular deity so you're like God is a water god, but then you still have a relationship with all these other gods, correct? Yeah, and, and it depends on sort of like, again, how different was, people practiced, you know? Was Dionysus, uh, uh, Bacchus, as the Romans called him, mm -hmm. which is easier for me to say, Dionysus? Dionysus. Dionysus. Uh, Dionysus. So was he the, like, was he ever like somebody that you cursed because you got too drunk? Or, but it doesn't seem like that's the relationship. It's not like, ah, fuck Dionysus. I, I partied too hard last I mean, I'm night. I mean, people blamed gods for a lot of things, I'm sure. Yeah. Like, uh, we know in, like, writings where people are like, ah, I feel like I've been cursed by Hera. Mostly when you maybe didn't abide by some of the their offerings. Or, or, or their you, teachings. Or their cautionary or, tales. Oh, yeah. Or you, 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 like, desecrated an altar or you didn't make an offering you were supposed to. But a lot of the Thonic cults had very particular rites and rituals that you abided by. And where a lot of times it's like, um, for maybe a lot of Greeks and depending on, you know, like everyone sat with it differently where it was just sort of like a way of understanding the world. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's kind of in the background, kind of like a secular kind of like, like, okay, I, this is kind of happening, but I'm not actively participating it to people who are like in these cults, actively participating in these rituals and these rites and being really connected. But the other pantheon of gods exist. It's just that you might have your patron God that's connected to your city or to your family or to your belief systems. But it was a sense that they all kind of, you know, were around. And Do you think that there was any such thing as atheism at the time? Oh, yeah, for sure. And I think when you get to different parts of, like, ancient Greece, like, the philosophers weren't, a lot of them were just like, mm, this is mm -hmm. just kind of storytelling. So I think, yeah, I mean, I think people sat within the, the way they sit with faith today, you know? Yeah, no, that's what it sounds like, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and it's sort of interesting, too, like, a lot of times, that's the hardest thing in therapy, and is to deal with someone's existential um musings you know like they're coming like global warming the world's terrible like why were you alive and i'm like hmm <laughs> i don't fucking know this is when i pretend to freeze yeah um so it those are complicated questions and i think well like so let's say uh, without giving uh without breaching confidentiality let's say i just said that to you mm -hmm. 
Like, how would you handle me in in that situation? Because I've I've experienced that with therapists. I just want to see how you do it. I mean, I think part of me is like trying to kind of first understand like what they do believe because whether we do, we ascribe to a philosophy or religion, like we still have an operating system. So it could be like, I believe when you die, you die, and it's like, okay, well, can is that okay? Mm-hmm. Or like, what is the meaning of life? Like, kind of uh, uh, kind of mining and and pausing and sitting with them with different philosophical idea ideas like well what about existentialism where we make our own meaning so if there's no purpose isn't that delightful because we get to sort of create our own um so it's like really trying to sit with the person and understanding like where this question is coming from because sometimes it's very situational sometimes it's related to like a chemical depression and sometimes it's just like the world is hard and we don't have like a sense of community or space in which we have find joy or purpose and mm-hmm. so I think it just depends, you know, and and sitting with someone in that that way. I I try not to sort of push a belief onto anyone because personally I believe any I kind of have a weird contradictory belief system where it's like I don't go around believing in ghosts, like I don't think ghosts are real, but like if I'm in Croatia like ghosts are real. <laughs> and so like I I kind of just like in what sense does it, what do you mean by that? I mean it's just because so many the ghosts are such a part of people's storytelling and the way that But I mean like you're 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 saying something that applies to like a very postmodern approach to like magic in general, right? Like yep. where it's like people believe it so much that it it becomes true like uh like a, you know the tulpas? Yeah. Like like like, like the Ben in Black, right? For yeah. example, like people that have only seen the movies don't realize that Men in Blacks are or uh, are um, they're just like they're they're created fantasy creatures that have come into existence because people believe in them, right? And it's a, it's a or, hard like I mean I can go in detail. We're but gonna get into yeah. now we're gonna get into debate because the original sightings of Men in Black right depicted them as sort of like gangsters from the anachronist gangsters from the fifties. And they would be like, which one, which, which like in the Roswell situation? No, like so. There's, I have a whole, I have a whole book right here that, on the on the on, on, the, men on the men in black, where it's sort of like this idea that after a UFO sighting, yeah. people would see these like kind of um, people dressed in like these suits. But a lot of times they said they were acting kind of funny, like yeah, pretending to be human. Human, exactly. And and, that's what threw me off when you said gangsters. I was like, but they would say they were like almost like they'd watched a gangster film from oh, the forties okay. yeah, 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 yeah. and were trying to be like. You didn't see anything, right? Yeah, yeah. They're like, what are you talking about? We're like, listen, she, you're going to keep your mouth shut. Um, and then some people would see them disappear. So they were they interdimensional beings. Like, were they tulpas? The idea of tulpa really came about, I think, well, it's like a, 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 a appropriation of a Tibetan concept. But yeah, I think yeah. a lot of people were thinking more like Slender Man, for example, right? Like a creepy pasta. Yeah, yeah. A creepy pasta that like we know we can trace the origin and the creator of. But then it sort of becomes in like you we kind of will it into existence because of our belief. I don't know. I've definitely heard the Men in Black. I mean, re- referred to as tulpas, but I, like that's just like that's we're a gonna have to, We're gonna have to get those people in here. No, I mean the last podcast on the left definitely describes them that way, and I think that I mean I think it's a broader definition. Like it depends on how specific you want to get on. Well, because on that. but then anything can be a tulpa. The idea is like is Bigfoot a tulpa? Is... I would say, well, if Bigfoot, like, here's here's the distinction. I think if Bigfoot is actually making you, like, if Bigfoot is real to you in a way that you're fucking up your entire life, like, it may objectively not be real, but the impact of if Bigfoot existing in your life is yeah. very real. Yeah. Right? And, like, and that's usually the case. And that's one of the things that, like, you know, we can go back to to, to the cult stuff. But that's one of the things that's interesting about, like, like when, when people like I, I would say that, yeah, people do have tulpas in their lives. Like, right, you, you, you know, like you have created belief systems. I think yeah. that that's the, I make Jasons. You know, the yeah, thing exactly. is, it's, the idea is like it's a psychological thing too, where it's like you, if you put energy towards something, your perspective, like reality, is fifty percent things that happen to you and fifty yeah. percent your relationship to those things. Yeah. yeah. So I think that 50% that we have control over is like, if I get fired from my job, how I relate to that is going to create my reality. I can yeah. either see it as an opportunity to try something new or like reaffirming a narrative about myself that like, I'm a loser, I'm not going to achieve anything. And we sort of create those spaces. Yeah, yeah. And in a way, the gods kind of in ancient Greeks, like knew themselves contingent upon humans. So their belief in them kind of kept them alive in some way, because if you weren't well, that, making an yeah. offering, then... So I think that there's obviously a relationship where... Like, 
we can create things into existence. Jesus is a tulpa. <laughs> uh, you, I didn't say that. I mean, that. Santa, Santa. I didn't say that. <laughs> but the idea is like... Some people would say. You know, and, and, and again, it's like, but the idea of a tulpa is, if I understand correctly, like you actually made something manifest in your life right and i yeah. think the psychological version of that i think we do all the time yeah, yeah. right like we can set ourselves up or to repeat patterns or kind of create things i don't really i'm not like a believer in like the secret where like no, if no, i no, just no, like no. sit here and want twenty thousand dollars like lo and behold you're just hand me twenty thousand dollars because i i think that sort of diminishes like systemic uh marginalization that goes on that yeah. you just can't like will yourself into better places sometimes but no, i no, do no. believe that like our perspective is a lot of that well i'm thinking more in terms of the chaos magic perspective of it like which is a very postmodern approach to ritual magic in general mm -hmm. because you are taking what works and throwing out what doesn't work and you're constantly reevaluating re it yeah. so which is which is essentially a same way of saying like going to therapy right like but but yeah. in a different it, like in a different modality and i'm not saying you should do ritual magic instead of go to therapy fuck that <laughs> but uh, come to me and we'll do both but yeah. the idea is like <laughs> yeah, yeah, i yeah. think of it in very much like the pulling from what we know like we i think as humans seek metaphor to to find meaning it's a it's like a lie that tells the truth it's a mm. it's a shorthand version to understand something more complicated and i think oh that's what like ritual does is it creates like a sense of connection or understanding and can be really powerful like last night at the solstice thing like it was really beautiful and bonding and we shared and it felt like uh it wasn't so much also about burning what didn't work it was like also sharing that space with other people and feeling like connected so I think like that's what we need is like kind of ritual connection, and I and I love the idea of magic as like a performance, like a mm -hmm. but but again that I don't think that my performance work had real effects on the way that I interface with people in my relationships. So you don't think it? Did? I did. I mean, oh, I, you, I think it, okay. I, it does. So I think like in that way it yeah, was yeah. worked in the way like kind of the principles of magic, and that's why I think I'm interested in these kind of cults and places because the way people have used metaphor and ritual and magic to try to make meaning and it's just fascinating because i think then there might be something a metaphor that connects to someone that they didn't know before you know like i worked with a, a family once in this um i asked them to sculpt what it feels like to be in the family and this woman made like a gargoyle and she's like uh, the mother and she's like i think i look like people think i'm a monster and that like no one likes me and because her, her kids had watched gargoyles at the time it was like that cartoon and she just knew about them through the cartoon. I said, well, do you know anything about gargoyles other than that cartoon? She's like, no, I just know they're ugly. And I said, well, you know, they were objects of protection. Like they were put on churches and places to ward off evil. And I wonder if you're trying to protect your family. And in that, you feel like this is how you, the position you've taken. And she was like, oh my gosh. She felt like something magical had happened. That mm -hmm. like this um, mean new meaning on this object that she created kind of made this new connection for her where she had a lot more empathy for herself yeah. and could understand her role. And so it was really kind of beautiful in that moment. I feel like magic did happen. Like we created this like, and it almost felt like, haha, -ha, you know? And I just happened to know that metaphor to help her make yeah. that connection. Mm. And so that's what I kind of think I do in therapy and my performance work is like kind of try to- I would have offer... talked about the voice actors on that show. Yeah, but... <laughs> well, that's why- <laughs> That's why I'm that's not why a therapist. Yeah. <laughs> That's why we have different jobs. Um, no, that's that's really interesting. Do you are you at all like up to date on any of the like Jack Parsons and like JPL and all those people that are like fucking creepy sex magic people? I mean, I the, the have you actually? You know what? Let's cut to the chase. Have you ever engaged in any sex magic? Have I ever done any sex magic? Uh, well, if you remember my earlier comments about my difficulty of surrender. <laughs> Um, sex with me is magic, but uh, I have not particularly engaged. You, you don't in sex dress magic. in robes and uh, hang out huddled mm, masses. No. no, no, not at all. No. But um, you know, uh, you know, who knows what twenty twenty three has in store? Yeah, COVID restrictions are gone now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I am still a hypochondriac, so that hasn't <laughs> disappeared. But you know, I think part of it is like there. That's part of what I'm interested in exploring in the next year. Actually, is this, and I think I'm on on that way is exploring this different kind of surrender through this. Um, through this kind of Dionysian, like, you know, like release where it is about ecstasy and orgy. And I mean, but <laughs> it is, but you still have a practice. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, the, but the idea is it's, it, but how that can relate to different things. Cause I yeah. think there are people who can be in orgies who are like contained still that 
drinking doesn't necessarily liberate it can also confine yeah, yeah so it's yeah. not no just that the, makes sense it's not just the act i think there are people who engage in sex and feel so enslaved by it in certain ways then um you know like if you're really connecting to someone and really experiencing that surrender and not just like chasing a high or a rush yeah, yeah. and i like to think about dionysus a lot in that um in therapy too is like a cycle where you have to dionysus was also about like wine but he was also about the agriculture of it like you've got mm. to plant the seeds you got to tend to it and then you can get drunk so it's like the complete cycle yeah, of yeah. ecstasy where it's not just all about the drinking like he's also like okay we gotta start getting ready for the next harvest come on and so i like the idea of like completing the cycle because i think we focus so much on just like that release and that and i think we create false surrenders mm, yeah. you know like where well, it's kind of what the food thing I was talking about. Like we create like diets and then we're like, you know what? I'm just going to eat all these donuts. And we feel like we've surrendered to something or like, I'm just going to drink all day because it feels like we've s surrendering. But I think what we really need to surrender is something deeper, you know? And, mm. and, and so for everyone, that's a little different. But I think that we create these structures to rebel from because we don't know how to release these kind of uncertainties or insecurities or other barriers. Mm -hmm. So it's not that I want to go on some sort of mad drug-fueled orgy because i don't think that would make me feel good but how can it be kind of the spiritual sense of like acceptance uh, accepting another person ac accepting a kind of a state um yeah so yeah that's interesting i i mean it's always fun because it is a very um piecemeal way of like selecting what you want so in terms of like like you can literally just be like i'm gonna do a little catholicism a little yeah. you know voodoo a little like whatever you know and then whatever works with you which is interesting it's actually i i used to i think that perspective is freeing for me individually and also in terms of not giving a shit about what people think like what people yeah. believe and what they need to believe because i think that a lot of times people still like want reality to be very objective when you talk to them yeah. and there's some a power in just sort of releasing and being like, okay, that is the real world. Yeah. Like where, where it's like, I mean, I don't necessarily agree, but I'm not like, what do I get out of like, exactly. you know, arguing your perspective and whatnot? Like, and, and, and to, by that, I mean, literally like Jesus is real to some people. Yeah. And, and I, think and, and I think that that's totally okay. And I, I like appreciate and love when people have these structures in which they see the world. I just have a problem when all of a sudden now we're creating legislation around it. Yeah, I think yeah. that's where it gets into like a tricky area. But I think as far as like us making meaning in, of our own lives, I think however we want to do it. And it's, it's joyful and fun to like meet so many different people because I, you know, we tend to sometimes kind of be in the same circles of you know, people that share similar beliefs and being a therapist, I think I get to like get all these yeah. windows into other people's systems. And it's like, you know, I have a client who like really believes in reincarnation and believes a lot of the things that are happening to them is from their past life. I'm like, okay, that's the metaphor we're using. So I will believe that with you mm. as long as I don't think it's harmful or causing them, um, you know, sort of any, any damage to them or anyone else around them. So yeah, it's, it's kind of a fun thing to, to have this sort of like contradictory multitudes you can hold in those experiences and like things i've experienced that i don't quite know like in preparation for the um for one of the projects i did about the orphic cult i went and did a past life regression um and i was just like i was so busy i didn't even know like i didn't even prepare for it so i didn't have time to even think about it that's hypnosis right um yeah it's like yeah you're in you're in a hypnotic state and you're being guided to like you know visualize these kind of past experiences and i wasn't i didn't know what to expect when i got there it was an office in westwood i but thought you it was, saw a ufo i didn't <laughs> see were, a ufo you were abducted but there's a but there is <laughs> I, but i do there, i have a whole other ufo thing but this was i didn't know what to expect this woman's office was much more like a clinical like a dentist's office than it was like i thought it was gonna be a little more mystic you know Mm -hmm. and she you know put me under and i just was like i'm not this isn't gonna i'm not gonna. and then all of a sudden i started seeing these things i'm like okay this is just my brain and so i had this whole life that i was uh, seeing and then the very last thing she asked me was to go to this person's death and it was like this woman in this like one room kind of by herself and i like was down like downloaded all this information about this person in one moment i got like really tearful and um i like was with this person as they were dying and they had like lived a life that was very like performative in that they just did the things to make it look like they were happy, but they never felt connected to anybody. They never really had a family. 
And the last thing they looked at before they died was this lamp that was next to them on their bedside. And the last thought they had was, that's an ugly lamp. And then they died. And I was just like, oh my gosh, wait, what who happened? Is this person? In, it was me in a past was, life. In your past life, okay. Allegedly. But I'm like... So, and that was Cleopatra. Um, <laughs> Cleop, like everyone, you know, I know Cleopatra is a popular person, <laughs> at least uh, 500 no, I, I people. Gotta, I got to I gotta bust your balls a little bit. Yeah. No, I'm into it. I'm totally... But no, I would but, love to do regression. But what I'm saying is like, I don't know if that was real. Yeah, I know. But now it's real. Yeah, yeah. Because I had that experience and it was sort of like this interesting idea of like, oh, like how how to not live an unlived life you know and so do i think i in the past life was an old lady who died and had an ugly lamp i don't know probably not but the but there's an allegory in your head the, that, exactly. that resonates the with metaphor you. happened it yeah. feels that's the problem with like you know in the satanic panic in the 80s like in your if you're in that kind of state you're so susceptible to um like memories so like our memories are very very like not they're very flitty and so um, therapists were like implanting memories in people's brains. So like, well, I mean, we can also get into MK Ultra. <laughs> well, oh my gosh, like, uh, like that's, that's why I'm never like, to me, you told me already that you're like, you have trouble letting go. That's a fu like you're letting someone hypnotize me. Hell the fuck no. Yeah. That's a trust. Oh my God. It's, it's, I would need a wild. videotape to see what happened. What exactly? Well, I mean, I feel the same way when I put, get put under and like anesthesia or something. If I'm like, I had some wisdom teeth pulled out and I like, yeah. just made sure my zipper was still up, you know? It's yeah. Like, but at least they're not fucking with my head. They're just like, if they jerk me off, it's different, you know? I guess. <laughs> I, I'm, d <laughs> anyway, not to minimize being raped when you're, when you're knocked out, yeah. but I'm saying like having people fuck with your head. Anyway, I, I have yeah. Also, uh, a long history of depression and mental health issues, so I'm very guarded. So that that might also yeah. be. And the thing is, like, I went into this with this woman, and I felt like I was like I wasn't like I was aware of what was happening, but it was again like very powerful because I have this memory, yeah, that feels like a real memory that is probably my you know subconscious putting together metaphors that make sense. So I can see the how it's, it, you know dangerous it can be to just kind of fiddle around in there yeah. and put in some thoughts and then all of a sudden you really believe it happened even though it didn't no that is terrifying to me yeah. that is maybe possibly one of the scariest things and i think it just has to do with like a history of having mental illness and being gaslit mm -hmm. about things that were actually happening and 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 having people lean into that you know like yeah. family members and whatnot like i'm not it, just everybody in the family that's how yeah. it rolls in families you know yeah not not any one individual like this just we do nasty shit to each other but I do. I, that is that is a terrifying idea. That idea of like Inception or whatever, like that terrible movie. But like the idea of just having somebody, and they fucking tried it, and they tr the, like the they really did. Like this isn't even conspiracy theory. Mm -hmm. They fucked people's lives up, yeah. trying to erase a person's personality and put in. This is in the fifties, whatever, and put in something else so that they could like. And the, it was all, like, all these evil things are always done with this, like, um, altruistic, like, oh, no, it's to protect our agents from the horrible things that they have to do because, like, a lot of CIA agents were killing themselves yeah. and, and stuff. So, anyway, that stuff is super dangerous. In fact, I won't play with sigil magic just because... I, you know, mm. I'll, have you have you ever been uh, like fired off sigils and whatnot? I have not fired off sigils. I yeah. have a whole you know, again. I have a, a very extensive occult man, myth, collection. and magic. I think mm -hmm. I've heard of that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I have a whole witch cabinet in the in the in the hallway of just books that I just am curious. I, I it's just like a fascinating thing, but I I tend to just sort of again sit more with my own kind of like practice. No, yeah. is a lot more just like intuitive and like again pulling from symbols of kind of Slavic culture, uh, Catholicism, because that's kind of like where I was raised to and kind of other kind of like metaphors that make sense to me. So it feels a little bit less like I'm following an instruction that I'm like, what if I mess it up? And now I've like conjured this demon. Um, it just feels a little bit more like intuitive and yeah. it, it works for me that way. But I'm fascinated with everything. Um, yeah, there's no, belief things. is one of the most dangerous things, you yeah. know, it, it really is like, uh, and, and I don't mean it in like a, uh, a secular sense or like, you know, like in a anti-religious spirit. I mean that like what you believe oh, yeah. is like dangerous sometimes it, and sure. it can be very harmful. I mean, just even with depression, like what the, 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 I, I mean like just a basic example, when I was at the, my most depressed, I thought everybody saw the way that the world, the way that I yeah. did. 
And then it's like, and I was just like, why is everyone else doing it? Everybody's lying to each themselves. That's a hundred percent not true. Yeah. <laughs> but it was my reality, you know? No, so, it's very it's, true. Yeah. And I think that's part of what, um, I think we unintentionally kind of have these behaviors and rituals that reinforce some of these negative beliefs. And I do see part of my therapy practice and performance practice is like having people create new rituals to create new stories, yeah. to create new beliefs. Because I do think a belief is a relationship to something, right? Like 50%, I said, is like fact. And 50% is our relationship to that fact. I don't want to change the facts. Yeah, no, you can't. You know, like, because it some people do. Yeah. That didn't happen. Um, But I think it's part of it is like, how can we work on our relationships to things? And I think through metaphor and meaning making is just a very powerful tool. Well, one of the, like, you have mental rituals. Specifically, you have things like, I'm so dumb. That's a ritual. Exactly. I'm such an asshole. It's an incantation. It's, yeah, it's a chant. It's exactly. Like, You're it's, repeating it yeah. over and over again. And One of the biggest changes for me was when I started saying could instead of should. Mm -hmm. And like should is so much pressure. Could yeah. is potential. Yeah. You know, and like, and, and shit like that. And Just I like little... to say want. Yeah. <laughs> instead. <laughs> instead like, of, yeah. Instead of could, like, oh, I could do that. I, I should do that. I want. Yeah, yeah. That. Yeah, yeah. You know, no, that's more empowering. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah, but it's true because all an incantation is is like a phrase that is repeated that then has some sort of external change happens or something happens, right? And I think again that negative self talk is just that. Yeah. yeah. No, for sure. I totally, I totally agree with that. Um, in terms of, I think that we ended up not giving the 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 not to jump too far back, but we did ended up not giving the the hinge tips. And the profile tips. So what are your basic profile tips? Because I'm definitely okay. going to make a clip out of this. Okay. So, I mean, this is hard because I think part of it is um, I, I, you really have to kind of see, like, the first thing I tell somebody is, like, I want you to, like, think about um, the different parts of yourself and, mm -hmm. and the places you want to share with your partner. So as you're taking your pictures, imagining, like, the different aspects of yourself. Like, are you an outdoors person? Or do you like movies a lot? So making sure that the photos reflect kind of the aspects of yourself mm -hmm. not just a good photo get a good photo nice lighting it works a lot but and then to really imagine creating space in those photos this is actually my friend stevie who's a um was a casting director she gave me this tip but she's like can you imagine yourself in that photo mm -hmm. so when you're looking at someone's profile if they're at the gym taking a selfie will you would you be there next to them yeah and one of the things for so young if i don't mind so you know, can edit this out if she um protests later but I'm she, not going to ask her. <laughs> she is um, so, so loving and so joyful, but she's also kind of like very like gregarious. And so a lot of her um, photos were her in like big costumes and like taking oh, yeah, up yeah, the yeah. frame. And I was like, you got to make room for a person in the picture because they're going to think this person has no room for me so unconsciously. And she's so sweet. Like I had jaw surgery and she made me like all these different kinds of soups. And I'm like, people want to see that part of you too. And so I just like took this very like nice picture of her sitting across the way. And so the, her multitudes can be seen. Mm. Also just like surprising how many people phrase things in the negative. Like, I don't want liars. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you're like, oh, oh someone's been hurt. Yeah, yeah, And yeah, they're yeah. not healed. <laughs> you know, but like phrase things in like the positive and the things that you want. And, and really take an opportunity to think about everything as like curating a sense of yourself. Mm. Um, so that way, you know, people are really getting a sense of you because you're not just trying to get as many likes as possible. You're trying to get the right person for you. And so, but a lot of times it's like really just, I'm sitting down and looking over and it's just like, Ooh, interesting. This joke can come across <laughs> as really sort of like pessimistic. Yeah. Yeah. And people are reading into so many things cause uh, you know, they're like analyzing these profiles and like, so I think the biggest tip that I'll give is just like, make sure there's room in your photo for someone. So if it's just too full of people or too full of stuff, like someone, you need to like make a little room so a person can be like, insert here. Do not crop out like a photo of someone that your arm is missing. Cause like sometimes I'm looking through people's photos. I'm like, is this your old wedding photo? You just looked really good in it and you just like chopped off. What about people that put the, the emoji over the other person's face? I think what you should do is just when you're out with a bunch of people, and you're taking those photos to say, hey, would you mind getting one of me alone? And But with space for a human. Yeah, you know, or just like, but alone you'll be, you'll be there, you know, there, there'll be space for you. And having those, because people sometimes think it's weird to be in a picture of yourself. I don't have any social media, so it mm. is a weird instinct for me to take a picture by myself. Um, but I think so many people do it, it's just fine. But if you're going to have pictures with like you doing something or at an event, like 
you know, if you're having to crop out people, like, I think there's a way to do it that you can sort of like, you know, have d- the sort of like idea that there's people around, but you're just you know, the focus of it. Mm. And yeah, and making sure that you're, um, that each picture tells like a story about you. Like, this is a picture to let them know I'm into this. This is a picture to let them know I'm into this. This is a picture to let them know that this is what I do. So they get a sense of you. Mm. I think that's really helpful. No, I think, it, I mean, it worked for me. So it worked for him. Yeah. I mean, I obviously haven't hit the peak as what <laughs> this I is mean, not I the, still have to take a look at it. And this really is see. not the first time that you've told me you want to take, give me a wardrobe change. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Mm. <laughs> and I'm not averse to it, but if you say mm. it to me every time, it's going to hurt my feelings a little bit. I'm only human. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, <laughs> that's why we never got, no, 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 no. We know, we know. <laughs> I'm not ready. I didn't come know. prepared. I came prepared to do this show. Okay. Okay. Not, not Look, like, I was just, I was just trying to help, you know, no, I know. I, it comes from love. I know. Um, uh, yeah. but yeah, I, I, I just remembered that I'm wearing an athletic jacket, which is probably a, a red flag for you. No, I mean, I think, you know, I like the color story that's happening. I mm. feel like it, the tones are kind of nice. Yeah. You know, maybe I just like... <laughs> the shoes need to go. Yeah. Well, yeah. these, I just haven't gotten new ones because yeah. I ripped these up skating. So is it really, it's just the shoes? I think, you know, I, you know, I was more being facetious. I think you okay. look very good. <laughs> Thank you. I'm yeah, very, you very vulnerable. Very good. You look very good. <laughs> I was yeah. like, he's a therapist. Yeah, no. this is what I tell, exactly. As soon as a client comes into the room, I say, you know what? Let me start first with this outfit before we get into childhood. <laughs> no, no, you're, you're fine. You're yeah. fine. Um, I mean, I definitely, it's like one of those things you don't know about your own triggers. <laughs> I know. I didn't realize. No, no. The I didn't power, even, the, the I power didn't, of my incantation. The power of you saying something about my outfit because you clearly know what the fuck you're doing. Uh, right? Yeah. I am wearing like a weird teddy bear. <laughs> yeah, but it just, shirt. there's a fit to it, you know? Yeah, uh, I found this in a thrift store I in love, New Orleans. I love how he's pretending like he didn't change sweaters. sweaters. I had to change sweaters because I realized <laughs> the yellow was not going to go with the... I was trying to pop out from the background. This was all to create an aesthetic tableau. Uh, well, since I'm in front of camera, I am not averse to doing a a, uh, a makeover with you and it's so young. So that okay. would be... That still sounds fun to me Great. when it's not stressful to me. <laughs> yeah. So when you have I'm time... Multitudes. <laughs> when you have time, uh, Soyang and I will give you a once over. Yeah. Just to you know just to help things well no pop. i literally have uh not bought new clothes in a while because it's it, coming out of covid i was like well you yeah. know and then i was a soccer coach for five years and i lived almost entirely in fucking track pants and i was like oh stretchy pants are dangerous <laughs> <laughs> You know, you're, you're like i'm still the same size no put on jeans you're like no <laughs> yeah i i do like a tight fit though yeah, you know, yeah because i like to feel like i'm being hugged yeah yeah you know so we'll, whatever I, you I, feel comfortable in too it's it's also not about you know it's about like just being comfortable and exuding confidence, confidence. Yeah, 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 yeah 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 uh I, t- I tend to stay towards like easy stuff but anytime someone buys me like i've dated women and they're like you know i'm like one of those guys mm-hmm. when a woman dresses me up I get very popular, (laughs) you know, because like uh, they they just have an idea, like they just pay more attention to that stuff. And I'm just like still a grimy skater in my head. You know, I would still be rocking Jinkos if I could. (laughs) But, but, you know, I think there's something too about like taking that that you like. No, no, yeah, yeah, creating like a style around it as opposed uh, to sort of you know just being a generic exactly. guy. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm definitely generic, dude. I, I and simple dude. T-shirts, uh, a jacket, and shoes, and every now and then a members only jacket. Okay. Well, we can work with that, but also like all the things I've learned about you. Um, you love sex magic. <laughs> uh, um, you know, uh, so like, I guess no, maybe that's I'm all I've learned. <laughs> but the thing is, so like, how do we put that into your wardrobe so people know? Oh, if I start dressing more like a magician, that'd be dope. Yeah, you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm actually being ironic there, but... No, but, I think we're on to something. I'm going to oh, tell So Young, we're going to look at uh, Anton LaVey, uh, David Copperfield. Copperfield. Uh, Just like, at least yeah. you didn't go with Aleister Crowley, because that... No, pro- I the don't styles think his from that style era is, great. is like fucking terrible. No, I don't think so. No, Like a no. uh, millionaire guy with no aspirations in life other than to just master magic is probably not my look well we can try on different things you know you never know <laughs> but robes and capes i think robes and capes or like the nexium like uh oh have you watched that documentary i have of course I that have. shit is fu- that that second season was 
dark. I have not actually watched second season yet. Okay, I'm preparing for it. But the fir- the first season interesting. The second season dark. Dark. Well, I again like I I love just the idea of how people look for community because I think that's what we're kind of missing sometimes yeah. is like sense of connection and that either comes through traditions and rituals or just like community and I think that's where we become susceptible to places that are offering us these answers and when I think of cults like you know the FBI defines a cult as like more of a negative cult right like a, yeah. a, so when I use the word cult I just mean like a subset of a of a belief yeah more like the cult of Saint Nick and, and yeah, like exactly. back in the day but I mean I think that part of the vilification comes with that monotheism right so that's that is what probably around the time where that starts to become because you know it's sacrilegious yeah. well if there's like one way to do something then the other ways are wrong yeah yeah so yeah but then so so uh, I mean we're What's Definitely that? over an hour. We're like an hour and 16. But okay. I d- just a few follow-up questions in terms sure. of like your Christian or your Catholic mm-hmm. upbringing. Sure. How much guilt to... Oh, I mean, I feel like my guilt is um, not just Catholic, Catholic from Catholicism. So my my parents were... It was Yugoslavia. It was communist. So it's a really strange relationship. I knew relationship. refugees when I was a kid in Italy. It was it was really... A, it's a weird relationship, I think, to Catholicism in a way because, um, again, having this sort of like tension between the, the um, communism and my parents like grew up in a very small town. A lot of the focus in... Um, in that town was around the Virgin Mary. Mm. So it's a lot of that sort of like Virgin Mary. She was almost like the... Like if God was like the 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 dad that like works a lot, and then the Virgin Mary is like the stay at home mom, so mm. she was the more accessible person. But I mean, I think the guilt. Um, I I went through all of the sort of like baptisms and confirmations, but my parents weren't really like going to church all the time. My mom, I don't even think over opened a Bible. It was more of like a cultural identity than more of like a religious practice. Mm. And I, I mean, it's I I am. As Catholic as a lapsed Jew is Jewish, I think. I, you know, like in in terms of like I don't believe I'm not practical, but man, sometimes that shit is still programmed in there. Yeah, and I, that's why I kind of have subverted a lot of those, um, or subverted or reincorporated a lot of those beliefs to make s- yeah. those m- keep those metaphors, but make them make sense to me. And like my dissertation was really about this Virgin Mary was was about this Virgin Mary apparition that occurred in the town my parents were from during communism and sort of the the chaos that ensued from that. But a lot of it was like reappropriating this iconography in a way that feels more subversive and more aligned with who I am and what I believe um, instead of battling it. And I think that's sort of like similar to in like Haitian Vodou where the, the sort of this practice merged with the iconography of Catholicism and sort of like bolstered something instead of fighting it and yeah. sort of like incorporated it in. Same thing with like Santeria. Yeah, Santeria. Know, and, all yeah. of those Caribbean religions. Yeah, and so I think I kind of did a similar thing of like took the kind of Catholic iconography and incorporated it into sort of a belief system that uh, is is my own, but I did go through, you know, like, mostly um, the macabre stuff on my case. <laughs> oh yeah, exactly. Like it's so well, it's so gaudy, but it also has got so many like the stories of the saints and the martyrs, and you know, it's it's chock I just, full of. It's so funny because like Trump's idea of like what is classy is like a very Renaissance kind of like... gold. <laughs> Yeah. I never made that connection. So he's got a very like referencing classicism. You know? Yeah, it's wild. But I mean, I do love, you know, I love walking into a church that just like gilded, yeah, you know, yeah. like I understand the sort of like it's a simple pew and we're like a community, but like I want the ritual. I want the gold. I want that. But again, the understructures of, of the problem problems of the sort of systems are, are one thing. But um, yeah, I've just incorporated that. And the guilt comes from so many other like... Well, can I ask you about Yugoslavia? Because actually, mm-hmm. so Yugoslavia is now what? How, uh, which countries? So um, uh, Croatia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Serbia, Slovenia, Macedonia. Um, Bosnia, that's Herzegovina is like Bosnia, Herzegovina. Is, that's that little place that has that. No, that's Montenegro. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm confusing it with another. Um, uh, or, or is it Montenegro that I was thinking of? Yeah. So... Um, they yeah it used to be sort of a cluster of southern slavic states and now it's like and they were the part 90s. of the soviet union or it, it was it was part of no it was so it, it was 
So it wasn't part of the Soviet Union, but it was definitely because it had its own weird relationship to cap like Tito at the time had a kind of a an interesting I'm sorry to laugh at your leader's name. Yeah. <laughs> Tito. Had a had an interesting relationship to Just communism. Picturing Tito Jackson. Different, I wish. <laughs> so different so he had a different relationship to communism? Yeah, it was a, it was a communist country, but it wasn't cut it wasn't under the Soviet Union. Okay. Right. And so um that just like now I learned something new today. I didn't yeah. know that in that area there was such a thing. Yeah, and then so it was Yugoslavia and then in the nineties there was like a revolution where or like these homeland wars and it's fractured into these different countries. That you kind of knew the region already. It was yeah. like these regions were just bound together. Yeah, I wonder but, how much of that was like CIA too. Well, you know, you can and the, never count the, them out. The for thing that is, shit. it's it's funny <laughs> whenever with, communism is involved. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. It, well, and yeah, and I think I have to brush up on my history of it because it's been like it was just it's funny to have like this conception of a space when you're younger, and then like in the '90s, you're like in a, you have another flag and another yeah, monetary yeah, yeah, yeah. source and something. That's insane. So, yeah. Yeah, but um, yeah. So it was just an interesting. I would I would go in the summers with my my family, but you know, like I said, I was born here, so it was an interesting kind of relationship, and it was a small town, so. It was, on an island that gets a lot of tourism and no, had no. a lot of tourism throughout that time. So it was much more Oh, it's open. beautiful, yeah. Yeah, and even during the time of communism, it was like very open to tourists all the yeah. time, and that was the main economy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. And then also they're always in the World Cup, uh, not Yugoslavia, uh, uh, Croatia. Or uh, that's actually my main relationship. I, I feel loved <laughs> right now yeah. by this cat. Yeah, that's on. This is another cat. <laughs> okay. So the other, the cat that was here earlier at all, she is been roaming Aww. around somewhere all right the cat i think needs attention so i think yeah, we're we at a good go. place. we're at a good place to wrap up uh anything that we can promote for you no no um I, i'm not you on any Instagram? social media no website? i'm not a, i don't have any websites is this because of your uh, career as a therapist no, no? I, I don't even have a website for my therapy um oh. i am this is something i'm i'm working on a 1-800 number okay um that i'll be people can call and figure out what i'm doing um but maybe we can just it's it'll be up in a week i don't know the number off the top of my head but you know maybe right. you can put a little send it to me and i'll try to i'll try to remember to put it in yeah um but, but yeah it's something i'm trying to work on but i don't know how i've managed thus far but like just it's all word of mouth so if you see me around say hello okay cool <laughs> and uh we'll be back well thank you guys for checking out that's sorry i got distracted by the cat thank you for so much for being on the show man it's been a real pleasure thank i look you. forward to looking sharper and having tighter threads and Can't wait to see your hinge profile. <laughs> I'm not necessarily ready to show it to you. Man, so young after I updated it, I told her I updated it, she was like prodding me to send her pictures of it. And I was like, it's not ready yet. Let me let me get it ready. And then finally I got She's it ready. Yeah. yeah, but she was like, Javier, you got to let people in. And I just sent her a big old <laughs> LMFAO because I literally had just met her. <laughs> I, was like, yeah. I was like, I like it. I like it. That's brave. That's brazen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, anyway. Uh, so yeah, so thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you, thank you guys me. for uh, for checking out the show. And uh, we'll be back next week with another artist and another top with another artist and another topic and hopefully another cat yeah. and the topic may or may not be art related uh but it's fine either way thanks thank you bye